Hey, it's Marcel. Let me get honest with you for a minute. We've reached a time in history when building up strong leaders truly matters if you want to grow your business. But managing through fear, command and control, and do as I say, ways of managing, is not going to get you there. So what will? In my research, I found that the most effective leadership boils down to six key behaviors. They are behaviors that, when filtered down to every management level, can create high performance in your teams and build a great work culture. By the way, this is the new topic that I speak on at company events and conferences and virtual stages all over the world. It's great for keynotes, webinars, half-day or full-day workshops, and leadership retreats. So if you want to learn a clear and practical framework to help design the best work environment for your people to flourish, this is the way to go. And I can show you how to do it. To book me for your event, visit my website, marcelschwantes.com, and click on Speaking. Enjoy the show. The future of work isn't about shareholder value, technology, metrics, or automation. It's about being human and putting people first through actionable love. Welcome to the Love in Action podcast, where we hold deep conversations with extraordinary people to help you grow as a leader and expand your business. Here's your host, Marcel Schwantes. Hey, glad you are here. Thanks for joining us today. If you're new to the show, a warm welcome. We know that there are literally millions of podcasts out there. So we're grateful and honored that you chose to spend some time with us. Thank you. And well, you know, if you like what you hear as well, would you kindly let someone else know about the show and share it on social media? Because doing so is going to help us get to our goal of 1 million downloads. So thank you for that. Well, we got a great show for you. International bestselling author Mark Miller is going to be joining us shortly. So you know I like stats. And I know that many of you like to hear stats. So how about this? According to McKinsey's Organizational Health Index, companies with great work cultures, you know, those up in the 20 to 25 percent, you know, with great cultures, those companies post a return to shareholders that's 60 percent higher than median companies. And you know what great cultures do for employees, right? It gets them engaged. They feel more satisfied going to work. It gets them up in the morning. And if I may, here are some more stats. According to Gallup, more satisfied employees have 17% higher productivity, 70% fewer employee safety incidents, and 40% fewer quality incidents. Well, I decided to bring in an expert to talk about culture and our distinguished guest today is Mark Miller. His team also conducted research with more than 6,000 individuals from companies like Amazon, Chick-fil-A, Delta, Disney, Google, and the list goes on and on. Let me just give you a quick preview of what he found because we're going to be talking a lot about this. In Mark's research, 71% of U.S. leaders believe culture is the most powerful tool to drive high performance. What's unfortunate about this is that even though the research is saying that culture is an important key driver for performance, it, it still ranks really low on the list of strategic initiatives. But Mark Miller believes changing culture doesn't need to be, you know, a challenging endeavor. Okay, so back in March, Mark wrote a groundbreaking book titled Culture Rules, The Leader's Guide to Creating the Ultimate Competitive Advantage. If you're watching on YouTube, there is the cover. So Mark shares this, this simple three rule framework to build high performance cultures that drive superior results. Yeah, I thought that would perk your ears. And we are grateful that Mark is here to share his findings with us. Now, if you're not familiar with Mark Miller, uh, I consider him a, a true pioneer in the leadership realm. He's an international best-selling author, and he currently serves as Chick-fil-A's Vice President of High Performance Leadership. 
He's released 10 books to date with over 1 million books in print in more than 25 languages. Mark's global impact continues to grow. And we are grateful that he is here and he now joins us. Mark, welcome to the Love and Action Podcast. Marcel, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be with you. Likewise, likewise. So we start with this. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> hey, what's your story? Well, it's a long and winding tale, but it began uh, selling chicken almost 45 years ago. I was an hourly team member in one of Chick-fil-A's restaurants. Unfortunately, I was awful as a team member. I knew that they were going to fire me any day. I mean, even as a kid, I had the awareness, this is not going well. So I made a strategic career decision, and I'm always careful to say this is not advice, but this is what I chose to do. I quit because I thought it would be better to leave of my, on my own accord than to have to explain the rest of my life why I got fired at Chick-fil-A. So I quit, and I went and got another job, and six months later, I got laid off and I thought, shoot, I need a job and I can't do what they do in the restaurant, but maybe I could work at their corporate headquarters, which of course makes no sense at any level in any universe, but I chalk it up to the mind of a child. So I walked into the corporate headquarters. I told the receptionist I wanted a job working in their warehouse. And so she told me to have a seat. And just a few minutes later, Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, came, took me into his office to conduct the interview. Now, that probably doesn't make sense to your listeners. It didn't make sense to me. I knew who Truett Cathy was. Why was he interviewing this kid to work in the warehouse? Well, I later learned that I was interviewing to be the 16th corporate employee. And if you've only got 15 employees, it makes a little more sense that the head man or the head woman would be conducting those interviews. And so I tell people it was a combination of God's grace and lack of discernment on Truett's part that he gave me that job working in the warehouse. And I got to work in the mail room as well because there weren't that many of us. And so I got to wear a couple of hats. And that was 44 years ago. That's amazing. Uh, I've had trouble holding down a job ever since. I worked all across the business. I got to start a lot of things. I don't think it had much to do with my talent. As, as much as it was, I'd raise my hand and it's I let the kid do it, let the kid do it. I started our corporate communications group and I started our quality and customer satisfaction group and on and on and on and on. A long and sordid tale. But what brings me probably to this moment today is about 25 years ago, we decided we needed to invest intentionally and strategically in growing our leadership capacity. And that began the journey that I'm still on today. Yeah. Well, I love your books. I love the, you know, a lot of your books are parable. They're stories that are, that are written. You know, I love the secret. I mean, you've co-written stuff with Ken Blanchard. This book is a little different. I mean, you you really take take research and write the book around the research. So give us kind of the, the 30,000 foot level of uh, what Culture Rules is about. Yeah, I'll give just a half a beat of context on that. So 25 years ago, we began to try and figure out how do we help increase leadership capacity? And it did result in that very first book that I co-authored with Ken called The Secret. But we we then realized there was there was value in having a point of view. And so our team began what is now a 25 year journey of trying to look at near term issues obstacles and opportunities and say, are there things that we can get ahead of to serve our leaders and leaders around the world? Sometimes we'll be even so bold as we'll try to look over the horizon and think, wouldn't it be good if, and we'll begin those types of uh, research initiatives that ultimately culminate in a book. And so it was that mindset that several years ago, we were trying to identify those near-term issues that would serve leaders. And we began to hear what you might consider weak signals around the topic of culture. It was coming up more and more in our conversations. There were more and more questions about culture. And then as we saw issues and challenges in our organization and organizations around the planet, we believe that if you if you just pull back the curtain just a little bit, you would find that the root cause was actually a culture issue. And so we decided a few years back, hey, this will be one of our next 
projects to see what we can do to serve leaders on the topic of culture. Now, of course, none of us understood or had any idea uh, what was going to happen with the global pandemic and the implications. But here's what I would say. We could talk all day about uh, the impact of, of COVID. But one thing that is, in my mind, beyond debate is the pressure and the stress and the strain that COVID put on organizational culture. So what started as weak signals several years ago, it's what every leader I talk to wants to talk about virtually. And I don't think it has anything to do with the book. I think what happened was COVID put pressure on the culture, just like putting pressure on a pipe. If you've got cracks in there, it's going to reveal them or a hose. If it's got even pinhole cracks and you put pressure on it, it's going to reveal those things. And so where COVID uh, actually put the, the spotlight on some strengths, what leaders really noticed are the cultural cracks and weaknesses that COVID exposed. And now as we come out of the transition, everybody's going, I got to work on my culture. I got to work on my culture. So we're so thankful and we feel fortunate that we've actually got a, a valid point of view that will serve leaders at this critical juncture in history. Yeah. So I do want to talk about the research sort of as a backdrop to sure. conversation, but I want to get this out of the way first. OK, culture is it for a lot of people. It, it's hard to grasp. You know, it's a lot a lot of people, a lot of leaders. It, it's hard to work on something or, or on, on building culture when you can't grasp it. You can't see it. Right. Or you can't feel it sometimes. I mean, that's what I hear. A lot of leaders tell me. The other thing is, you know, you, you take. 10 companies and you might find 10 different cultures, some good, some bad, right? So help us to make sense of it all. I mean, what do we need to understand first about what culture is and what it's not? Yeah. Well, you just hit on one of the major challenges. There are other challenges. Everyone's unique. You reference that. If you have 10 different companies, you'll have 10 different cultures. You'll actually have more than that because you'll have subcultures or what we call micro cultures within those cultures. We might talk about that later. So, yeah, they're all unique. They're always on. Uh, the leader has to be involved. It's so complex. Many leaders don't even know how to begin. And it's invisible. What do you do with something that's invisible yet powerful? In fact, I would argue the most powerful force in an organization is the culture. On top of all of that, your specific question about lack of clarity on definition. We could not find, and we tried. We weren't just out to write a new definition. We went out trying to figure out what, what is culture, and there's no consensus. There, there's not even a general consensus on what culture is in an organizational setting. And so we did write our own definition. And we believe that culture is the cumulative effect of what people see, hear, experience, and believe. The cumulative effect of what people see, hear, experience, and believe. And that was actually encouraging to us because who has the greatest influence in an organization on what people see, hear, experience, and believe it's the leaders. It's the leaders. So we, we take great hope in that working definition. Yeah. And, I, and I'm glad you brought up that, that working definition. I wrote it down. I'm going to say it again for my listeners. The cumulative effect of what people see, hear, experience, and believe. So to me, that speaks to it's experienced individually through many touch points and encounters, right, between people. And then that's the yes, way it's, ex mm -hmm. it's, it's experienced individually and the culture is the cumulative effect of those experiences, which is another reason it's so complex and hard to, and, and and then hard to one, build yeah. hard. And, and so there, there's one more. Uh, David uh, Foster Wallace, the novelist philosopher, uh, told the story years ago at a commencement address about two fish young fish that were swimming along. They were met by an old fish coming their way. And the old fish turned to the young ones and said, how's the water, boys? Well, they didn't even respond. They just kept swimming. And, and once they got out of earshot of the old fish, one of the young fish turned to the other one and said, what the hell is water? So here's the deal. Leaders have, if they're not careful and if they're not thoughtful and if they're not strategic, they actually have water blindness. 
because they're in it and they can't even see it unless they make intentional efforts to see it. Yeah. And and that's the 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 part that I wanted to I'm don't worry, I'm bringing the research in, but this one really stuck out to me. You you said it in such colorful and vivid language. I, you know, I've always known that leaders are the champions uh, and, and the guardians of the culture, but you stated it as leaders animate culture, animate that yes. word. Okay, explain. Yes. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. We always try. I mean, we're going we're going to talk about the research and the diligence. And I had a team of world class people who worked for years doing all this. But we always try to say, what's the essence of what we have have, have unpacked here? And it is that leaders animate culture. They they breathe life into culture. That's that's the denotation of an, uh, animate that we're using here. Leaders breathe life into a culture or not, or not. See, because every organization has a culture, every organization. It's either by design or it's by default. And leaders choose, leaders choose. Or their their lack of a choice is in fact their choice. You will have a culture. Yeah, it's either by design or by default. Man. Okay. The research. Give us a backdrop on it. I, I mean, it's, it was pretty substantial. What did you set out to find and, and yeah. who did you speak with? Okay. Okay. So uh, the, the short version of, again, a very, very long story is with most of our projects, not with every project, but with most of the projects, we, we love to have a research component because I never want to merely publish my bias. Now, I can't promise you and your audience and the readers that I've totally eliminated my bias, but we never start there. Our first question on every project is what is universally true about this topic? And so in this case, we said, let's ask people around the world. And we ended up, as you mentioned in the intro, we talked to over 6,000, either either interviewed, surveyed or did focus groups with over 6,000 folks in 10 countries, C-level, mid-level, and frontline employees to really try to get inside their head and their heart. What's their, what's their belief? What's their experience? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their obstacles? What are their barriers? What are their fears? Because we were looking for something that we could share with, with leaders around the world. Yeah. Well, Mark, you have seen a lot of data in, in your role at Chick-fil-A. Did anything stick out on this this time around that surprised you? Well, I'll, I'll share two stats. And again, it's a recap of, of two things you said in the intro. One thing that did not surprise me was that over 70 percent of leaders say culture is the most powerful tool at their disposal to drive performance. Now, I don't know that I knew that the number was going to be 70 percent, but I thought any seasoned leader, they've got to rank culture pretty high when it comes to driving performance. By the way, there was nothing higher in the world that any leader, again, 72% said it is the most powerful. So maybe that's an insight. Maybe it's not. It, it affirmed for me that leaders know this is really important. The concerning stat was that when you ask them to rank their priorities, the same leaders, let's look at the U.S. audience. The numbers vary by country to country, although there was there was a, a, an amazing level of consistency. I think globally, the answer to this next question was 67%. But I mean, where it was 72% in the U.S., 71%. So the numbers were uh, amazingly comparable. But what was troubling, we asked these same leaders to rank their priorities and in the U.S., creating and managing culture came in as their 12th priority. 12. These are the same men and women that just said it is the most powerful tool at my disposal to drive performance, which, again, on, on face value is nonsensical because most leaders I know care about performance. That's why they're leaders. If they don't care about performance, I'm wondering why they're leaders, right? So if they care about performance, again, I would just give leaders the benefit of the doubt, and they acknowledge they have this tool, the most powerful tool 
at their disposal, and yet it's 12th on their priorities. So that actually became the focus of our efforts. How do we close this knowing doing gap? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what we went to work on. Yeah. And I, we want to get into the, that closing that gap, but I'm so curious, what do you attribute that, that gap to? It's quite a, quite a big gap. Okay. Two things, two things. And one I'm going to hit on real quick because it's not actually what we're talking about today. There may be someone in your audience that knows our previous project was on leadership effectiveness. We wrote a book called Smart Leadership. We believe that there are too many leaders who know how to lead, but they're not leading to their full potential. And so that project was another global kind of let's let's figure out what's impeding leaders effectiveness. And we concluded that it's a it's a it's a complicated and toxic mix that varies from individual to individual and includes things such as busyness, distraction, complexity, fear, fatigue, maybe in some cases, even success is impeding higher levels of success. So we call that quicksand. We call it quicksand. And again, it may even vary from season to season in an individual leader's life. And so here's the deal. If, if a leader is in quicksand, they are not thinking about culture. They are thinking about survival. Oh, by the way, if a leader's in quicksand, you can't help others out of quicksand. So there's a real good chance the people around you are in quicksand. Quicksand too. Which means yep. you've, you've just lowered the efficacy of, of your entire team and potentially your entire organization. So I think the number one reason more leaders don't work on culture is they're in quicksand and survival is a higher priority in the moment than culture. Now, we're not going to talk about that unless you want to come back to it in Q&A, but we, but we did create a, a free resource. Uh, if anybody wants it, it's free. All you do is text be smart with no space, B-E-S-M-A-R-T. You text that to 66866, 66866. And I'll say one word on behalf of my team. I'm proud of them. They did great work on this. This is not the kind of assessment. It's only about 25 questions, but it's not the kind of assessment that you you finish it and you go, well, that was interesting. And you throw it in the trash can. This is the assessment that says, based on what you said, here are some tangible, tactical things you can do to begin getting out of quicksand. And the answers are directly linked to your responses. So it's not just some generic, do these three things. And so that's the number one reason that, that leaders aren't working on culture. The survival is a higher priority. We didn't go there because that we think that's real and that's legit, but there's another reason. And it's what this book is about. And it's so complex that many leaders found it not to be actionable, it not to be approachable, actually didn't know what to do next. I got a text today from a leader going, help me. Now, he he told me he hadn't read the book. He knew I had a book on culture. And I said, well, let me give you the summary. I actually texted it back. I mean, but the book is what to do because he, like so many leaders are going, I don't even know what to do. It's invisible. I can't see it. I don't know how to define it. I know it's important. What do I do? And so I know you love storytelling. Let me tell you the story that provided the breakthrough for us as we tried to figure out what do we do with all this complexity? Now, most of the projects we've done over the years, we're going to end up talking to the Navy SEALs just because they're an elite high performance organization. We can almost always learn something from the SEALs. And we were inspired by a story from just a few years ago. The SEALs said that they needed to pause and document their mantra. And as they described it, they said they had been moving at the speed of war, which is interesting. It's probably the same speed your listeners are moving at, but the difference is people are shooting at them, right? So it's this, this like, there's all kind of stuff going on. Oh, and people are shooting at us. But they said, we felt it was important that we pause because we needed to prepare something for the next generation. And the first thing they wrote down 
was shoot, move, and communicate. Shoot, move, and communicate. Now, that's not my advice to you guys and gals regarding culture, but but let me tell you why that inspired us. We thought how clarifying, how succinct, how helpful must that be? There's a lot more you need to know to be a SEAL, but that's what you need to fight another day. So we went to work and said, could we find the shoot, move, and communicate equivalent for leaders as it relates to culture. Make it simple, make it succinct, make it directive, make it actionable, and make it work. And that's how we came up with the three culture rules. That's fantastic. All right, Ian, we've hyped up the <laughs> the, the three rules in the intro pretty good. So let's dive in here. I'm, I'm gonna let you lead the way here. Sure, sure, Where, I'll hit them really know, quick. I yeah, so I'll start, hit them quick start, we'll we'll, Perfect, rule okay. number one. Rule number one is aspire. The leader must share their hopes and dreams for their culture. Now, some of you are wondering, well, that feels pretty obvious. And my team debated, it, do we really have to say that? Well, here's why we have to say that. There are far too many leaders in the world that cannot clearly and succinctly share their hopes and dreams for their culture. And some will say, well, it's in my head, it's in my heart. And I would say, well, it can start there and it probably should start there, but it can't stay there because you need others to help you make it a reality. It, it, it has to be something that is clear, simple, and repeatable. So the first rule is to aspire. The second rule is to amplify. And this is to always look for ways to amplify the aspiration and to showcase and to validate and to illuminate and to help people understand that the aspiration is real and that it's not the flavor of the month and that it's important and it's got staying power. You're always looking for ways to reinforce the aspiration. And we can talk more about how you do that. But let me say this. We chose the word amplify on purpose because there's so much noise in the world. People will forget. Leaders forget sometimes, which is the ultimate tragedy. But certainly people doing the day to day work, it's really easy for them to forget the aspiration because of the noise. So leaders have the responsibility and the opportunity to amplify the aspiration. So those are the first two rules. Before I give you the third rule, let me tell you, this is an inflection point in this whole story. Because if you have a clear aspiration and you amplify it well, you will make progress toward the aspiration. It will actually work. And because leaders love progress, I love progress, you love progress, we have to fight the tendency to check the culture box because you wanted this, you did these things, and now you got it. You got it, you got it, you don't got it, right? If, if, if you declare victory, you're actually going to lose, which is why you got to move to the third rule, which is to adapt, to constantly work to enhance the culture. See, if you, if you move into protection mode and you try to shrink wrap it, you'll actually suffocate it. You'll kill your culture. And so real quick, I want to give three different domains. And for those that have read the book, only one of these are in the book because as we do this work and we deploy this work and we have conversations and we work with leaders, I stay on the learning curve. And so I'm going to add two things that aren't in the book. The thing that is in the book is when you want to enhance your culture, you first have to eliminate any toxins that exist. Got a whole chapter in the book on that. Toxins are patterns of unhealthy and unproductive behavior. You probably would have guessed that. But for the leader that says, great, I don't have any toxins that are at the level that require my intervention. Does that mean I'm done or I can move into protection mode? No, 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 no. There are other ways you can enhance your culture. So these are two things that if I do a second edition, I will include the, the second domain for um, enhancement is you can double down on strengths. 
you can intentionally and strategically decide that you're going to take something that you do well and you're going to get better and you're going to sustain those gains. And, and as a result, you will have enhanced your culture by doubling down on a strength. The third is something I hear almost nothing about, and that is to add new capabilities as a way to enhance your culture. Let me give you an example because that might sound weird to you. Again, I've never heard anybody talk about this, but we've experienced it, and I, and I know it's real. About 15 years ago, our president said he wanted our organization to be more innovative. Now, we're no strangers to innovation. Truett Cathy invented the chicken sandwich. But here's the truth. If you look at our history, innovation had been somewhat random and sporadic. And we had a senior leader that said, I've got an expanded aspiration. I think we can enhance our culture if we work intentionally, purposefully and strategically to be more innovative. And so we began to amplify that aspiration and we did all the things you would expect. And we we articulated our point of view and we put staff on it. We put resources on it. We did training. We built a innovation center. I mean, we did all the stuff you would expect. And here we are 15 years later and we are now a more innovative culture, a direct result of a leader who wanted to enhance the existing culture by adding new capabilities. So that's about as quick as I can get through the three rules, but that's that's what we have tried to share with leaders so that they can build their own high performance culture. Perfect. I want to bring back some of the some of the, uh, let me bring back rule number one, if I may. And uh, please. And, yeah. And, and just make it a little more practical for our leaders, uh, some who may have listened to you and they're already overwhelmed about even how to start. So rule number one, aspire. OK, so you, you mentioned share your hopes and dreams for the culture. What's a good starting point here if you're a leader? Well, you probably as, as pedestrian as this may sound, you've got to have some clarity personally and individually on the language and the terminology you want to use. Now, again, this sounds like a very basic place to start, but it is a stumbling block for so many leaders and organizations. And here's why. Mission, vision, purpose, values, ethos. It's like people go, which one's first? Do I need them all? How do they work together? Are they really different? But here's the confusing part, and I don't recommend you do this because I've done it for you. If you research those terms, you've got really smart people that define them very differently. In fact, some people's definition of mission is somebody else's definition of vision. It's, and it's so confusing. Now, you can parse out differences. And in the book, I did my very best to say, here's the preponderance of the evidence, what most people mean when they say mission and most people mean when they say vision and what most people. But 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 what that that's actually irrelevant. What matters is that you decide if you want to which of those mechanisms you want to use as a means of sharing your hopes and dreams for your culture. You, you, and then it needs to be clear, simple, and repeatable. There's a quote. It's not in the book. I wish it was. If Again, I found this after the book was published, but if there's a second edition, this will be in there. Some of your audience uh, re would recognize the name Peter Drucker. I would argue the greatest management and leadership thinker of the last 2,000 years. And they were talking to Drucker about this topic, and he chose the word mission. Again, I think he was referring to it broadly, but you'll have to, that'll be up to your own interpretation. But he said, if you can't put your mission on a t shirt, you don't have it yet. Well, I think that was Drucker's way of saying clear, simple, and repeatable. Clear, simple, and repeatable. Now, you can have a lots of stuff underneath it. You can, you can have this overarching cultural aspiration, and then you can have clarifying or qualifying statements. You can have values. You can have a mission under a purpose or under a vision. You can, you can use any of that you want. But at the end of the day, if somebody said, what is your aspiration for your culture? What do you tell them? And is it something that everybody in your organization can repeat, not just 
from rote memory, but they take it from their head, they put it in their heart, and it shows up in their hands. And they actually begin to do the things to make it a reality. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, so you got the aspiration part down. That's rule number one. You under, you you've defined the words that that you have chosen for your entire organization. Okay, so now you jump to rule number two, which is the amplify one. Okay, now you need to take the aspiration and reinforce it continuously. Yeah, let's get practical. Yep. How, yep. What what's a good okay. plan? What's a good plan for that? Okay. You would imagine there are so many things you can do. And and I would say, great, over time, you'll do scores and scores and scores of things. We chose to feature a few in the book, and I'll, I'll share one with you right now. The most important thing you and I can do as leaders to amplify an aspiration is role modeling. People always watch the leader. So let me tell you a quick story. Uh, there may be some historians watching this. My favorite historical example of this is Alexander the Great. If you don't know his story, 326 BC, I may not have that right, 320 something BC, he was 22 years old and started his 10 year campaign to conquer the known world. So get your head around that, which by the way, he did. And if you go back and read history, it's it's fascinating. You if you run it through a modern lens, you could actually articulate with, I think, pretty high confidence that he had at least two core values. And it was courage and bravery because he talked about it all the time. Those again, let's say those were his core values. He reportedly even told his men they would never die with an arrow in their back because they would never retreat. All right. So he has an aspiration. Well, how did he amplify that? He did a lot of things, but the one I want to point out to you today is that he led from the front on every major battle. He showed men what courage and bravery looked like. Some historians have, have uh, speculated why his army was so successful. In many cases, they were outnumbered. And they think that it may have had something to do that they weren't just fighting for their country and their cause. They were fighting for their leader who was fighting with them. The best, the best way to amplify an aspiration is with your daily actions. People always watch the leader. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then brings us to rule number three, adapt, always work to enhance the culture. Anything really stuck, st sticks out here? Because you talk so much about listening and having listening mechanisms in place and all yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah. I would, I would say that to adapt well, you need to listen well. And I would be a fan of both quantitative and qualitative. It's like, yeah, you might need some listening mechanisms where you can track over time, but I would hope that you're listening so well all the other days of the year that you would not be surprised on the day you get back your engagement survey or your organizational health survey because you're always listening to people. Now, you listen for, for a lot of things, but as it relates to this conversation, you're actually listening for people to understand the aspiration, to tell you how they've internalized the aspiration, to tell you what barriers and obstacles they need your help with so that they can pursue the aspiration. The success stories about people trying to help create the culture you're trying to create. And, and listening is so, so critical and so essential. That, that's always a good first step if you want to adapt well. That's great. All right. Well, th this this is uh, folks. Mark just kind of gave you the the sort of the summary of the whole book, and I'm so grateful for that, Mark, because uh, truly, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be complex when we build our culture, and now we have a really really simple roadmap to do it. So, by the way, some of us that are in the C suite listening, we got the three rules, and we're like, yeah, that's great, but I still feel like I'm looking up. And I have to climb Mount Everest, right? So 
maybe you can encourage those people who have may have a tough road ahead. Maybe it's somebody that inherited a really bad, toxic culture. What would you say here is the first step? Go back to rule number one or? Well, keep in mind that these three roles are always in play. You're always sharing your hopes and dreams. You're always looking to amplify and you're always listening uh, on guard for the toxins and trying to identify opportunities for other enhancements. So I, I would say that, well, not only, oh, yes, they, they're they always in motion. Somebody said it's like, uh, this was uh, a listener from a, a previous podcast said, it's like a cycle, a virtuous cycle, but it moves really fast. <laughs> okay. It moves really fast. So, I, but to your point, I love the question. So to your point, I'd say two things. Yes, you're going to be doing all of these, but if you don't know your hopes and dreams, you need to invest some time and energy trying to discern that so that you can begin to share that. The chances of you creating something you cannot articulate are pretty close to zero. And and people, people always watch the leader. So if you are not clear on what you're trying to create, they are not going to be clear on what you're trying to create. And what you may find if you've got a highly engaged and energized workforce is it creates more chaos because they're all moving in different directions because they're trying to interpret or guess what's important to you. And sometimes they'll guess wrong. Other times they'll just guess differently and dissipate all of the energy that you might channel towards your aspiration. So get get as clear as you can and then start talking about it. I was challenged during our interviews. We were talking to a senior leader from Netflix, and I asked about how often he talked about their cultural aspiration, which is they want to their ethos is freedom and responsibility. So I said, how often do you talk about that or some facet of it? He looked at me like I'd lost my mind and he said, well, every day. He said, why wouldn't you? He said, there's nothing more important. Why wouldn't you talk about it every day? And so that kind of challenged me. Okay, how often am I talking about the culture or or facets of the culture? Then I had another leader. This this didn't even make the book. This was another leader who leads an organization. He's retired now, but they served in 120 countries-ish, like big organization. And he said, oh, well, I talk about the culture in every meeting. And I said, what's that look like? And he said, well, if if the culture or some aspect of it has not been appropriately discussed in a meeting, at the end of the meeting, I link what we just talked about back to culture. And he said, if I can't connect the dots, then my next question is, why were we talking about this? Why were we talking about this? And so a bit back to your question for advice. Yes, you, you've got to be listening, but you need a point of view. You need an aspiration and you begin to share it. You begin to share it. And, and that's a tremendous place to start. Mm. Wow. This has been such a rich conversation. Mark, what's your ultimate hope for people reading this book? <clears throat> All right. I'll, I'll, I'll share this. It's the story I closed the book with. So if you do read the book, you don't have to read the last chapter. Uh, it's, it's really kind of an epilogue. But let me tell you the story really quickly. Some of you have seen the movie Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg, or you've read Ernest Cline's novel by the same name. And don't worry, I'm not going to do a spoiler thing for those that haven't and would like to. But I want to set it up because I want to share a quote from that book. The story takes place in two worlds, the real world and an, an online world, a virtual world. It's called the Oasis. And so the, the hero in the book is a young man named Wade Watson. And someone has asked Wade to explain the allure of the Oasis. And he said, well, here's the deal. He said, people go to the Oasis for what they can do there. And they stay because of who they can become. Now, I know it's not appropriate for me to have an aspiration for your organization, but I actually do. And, and that is that you would create a culture, that you would create a place so 
life-giving, soul-enriching, performance-creating culture that people would be attracted there for what they could do. They could actually get a job. But once they're in your organization, that they would stay because they realize who they could become. That's kind of been my story 45 years later here at The Chicken. I came for a job and I stayed for what I might become. That's what I wish for you guys. That's awesome. Mark, as we wind down here, I pose you the leadership love question. I'm an idealist. So I believe love is the solution that's going to break those those strongholds of fear and toxicity and and so many things that keep organizations from becoming high performing cultures. So how do we lead our businesses and organizations, our employees with more practical and actionable love day in and day out? I think knowing that I need to answer this very succinctly, I would encourage the listeners to embrace one practice, to try and add value to every person you meet. Now, now for, for the pragmatist in, in, the, in the audience, you're going, whoa, whoa, that's impossible, that's impossible. I want you to listen real carefully to what I said. Try to add value to every person that you meet. It's the trying that changes you. Because when I'm trying to add value to you, my focus has shifted from me to you. We, ne- we need to be serving leaders, not self-serving leaders. And the only way to do that is to shift our focus to others. If you'll try to add value to every person you meet, it'll change your heart and it'll change your leadership. That's beautiful. Okay, we bring it home with two questions as we do with every guest. Okay. Mark, personally, what's really tugging at your heart right now that you'd like us to know? What's tugging at my heart is I'm I'm excited uh, about the next chapter of my story. I am about to leave Chick-fil-A after 45 years, and I am on a journey to try and serve 100 million leaders in the next few years. And so um, it's going to be an exciting chapter. Man, I would. Uh, that's another podcast in itself. I, I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Well, I'd love to share it with you. We're we're in the process of figuring that out. <laughs> wow, what an endeavor! All right, finally, you close us out like every guest does. What, what's that one thing you'd like our listeners to walk away with that's going to inspire and motivate them? Well, I'm not sure about inspire and motivate. But I noticed on your website that you had a quote from John Maxwell, and he has been a friend and mentor uh, for me for many, many years. And he he got it right. And I don't even think John was the one who said it first, but everything rises and falls on leadership. And so for those of us that have chosen this path, it's hard, but the rewards are unspeakable. When we can help people and organizations uh, excel beyond their wildest imagination, I can't think of anything else that I'd rather give my life to. And I'm excited that so many of your listeners have chosen that same journey. Mm, Yeah. Hey, people want to get a hold of you. So what's the best way to do that? Show us a couple of options and websites or whatever way you want them to contact you. Okay. We're about to launch leadeveryday.com. Right now it's a book site for culture rules, but it's going to be a fully orb uh, site that is built around distinct user pathways. We're not trying to sell anything. We're trying to serve leaders. So when you go on the site, I want to work on myself. I want to work on my team. I want to work on my organization. And it takes you to whole different worlds. So that site is going to launch in the next 30, 45 days. You can also reach me with my cell phone, 678-612-8441. I'd love to serve you. And I'll be sure I'll put all of that 
on uh, my show notes. Mark, it's been real. It's been fun. But I mean, you have uh, exceeded my expectations for what I imagined this conversation being. And I'm grateful for it. Thank you for your wisdom today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And I hope we can talk again soon. Well, you can keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag love in action podcast. And as I mentioned earlier, look for my show notes, as well as a YouTube link to watch the show on my website, marcelschwantes.com. And finally, hey, if you're interested in sponsoring an episode of the show, let's chat. Reach me on my website or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening to the Love in Action podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, subscribe, and leave us a review. Until next time, don't forget, the future of leadership is love in action. Believe it, practice it, and watch your business grow.